Uh, so, hey guys, um, thanks for waiting. Just give us like two or three more minutes. Yeah, we don't hear you. I think it has to hold up. Better now? Thank no. Test. Test. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but I hear something. Yeah. Yeah. There's some tapping. <laughs> <laughs> but don't hear my voice that good? OK, I mean, uh, we still have to wait two more minutes. Uh, so thank you. So uh, <laughs> I can also use this one. Is this working? So this seems to be another reason why we'll, uh, that we will need two more minutes, apparently. Um, I was about to say we need two minutes for another reason, but uh, apparently we need two more minutes to figure out the back here. Is it two plus two now? Or? Uh, I hope not. Um, but I just wanted to inform you that uh, it's great that you're here, and we'll start in like um, two to four minutes. <laughs> Ah, there was a bunch. Yeah. And the recording is. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, I hope this is, yeah, this is much better, I think, right? Um, so, welcome again. Um, we have October, we have another meetup. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Florian Turk. I will, yeah, I'm in the board of the Vienna Data Science Group, and I will do the moderation of, uh, of tonight. Um, we have the usual agenda as um, every meetup that we have. 
uh, we will have uh, a little bit of a switch here. Uh, so Miklos will start actually to present some of the programs that they provide here at uh, CU. Um, then again, Wolfgang, our uh, chairman, will uh, tell you what, this, what the Vienna Data Science Group is doing aside from those meetups. Um, and then we'll have our main talk. So uh, after the course last time um, to the graph databases, I hope you all enjoyed that one. Uh, we are now back to LLMs because it's still a very hot topic. Um, I think everybody by now has uh, tried out what is possible and there are a lot of applications already floating around. Uh, so we'll have some general introduction um, with some details um, and then we'll go into more detail with some real hands-on on how to leverage the, the, the power of, of LLMs uh, when it comes to developing software. Um, then again, we have uh, the open mic. I think we don't have any uh, um, anybody who wants to speak yet, but um, you still have the chance to do so. So if you have uh, want to take a part in this one minute slot, just tell us and we will, can put on the slide or you can also do it without a slide if you want to promote yourself or anything that you're doing or if you're looking for a job or something like that. Um, and we again have uh, the raffle. So we have the, um, the book again here uh, and one of you will win the book again. And then, of course, there's um, food and drinks um, and socializing. Um, so with that, I think I will hand over to, to Miklos. He will tell you a little bit more about um, the host, who is so generous to um, host us here today, tonight. So welcome. Uh, my name is Miklos Koren. I'm a professor of economics here at CU. And I'm super excited to uh, host you here. And CU has been um, sponsoring VDSG in, in the past, and we hope to continue uh, this in the future because we're in Vienna and we love data science. So, so welcome, welcome again. Let me say a few words about what we're doing here. Um, and I'll talk mostly about our MS Business Analytics program. Uh, so what this program is, and I realize that here I may be preaching to the choir, um, but give me, give me a little bit of, of time and you see why I'm telling you about this. Uh, so this is a one-year program where the idea is to, uh, to teach you all kinds of aspects of, of data science that are kind of related to business uh, applications. And we have actually scholarships available until the 4th of February. Uh, so if you do think that, okay, I know all of this or most of this, but I want a degree in, in that topic, uh, make sure to, to reach out and then and, uh, uh, we can discuss your, your application. So as I mentioned, all of the different topics related to data science, foundational, like the, re the related math and you know how to use Git and the terminal and the uh, informatic uh, background, um, we have a module on data engineering. We were just discussing this, like how SQL is having the comeback uh, for like you know many decades now, and these are of course super important for for data science. Uh, data science, when it comes from like exploratory data analysis to to causal causal inference, we cover all of this. Machine learning, text analysis, uh, data visualization, and and more like business oriented. Um, applications like how to manage analytic projects and we have a capstone uh, project to close to close the year and so this is a lot of uh, material to cram um, into one year but uh, but the students will find it really really helpful to to not only go through all of this but especially to to um, do the capstone so some of our instructors and you will see many uh, familiar faces uh, here and um, well, not all of them are here today, but still they may look familiar to you. Um, and just let me tell you a, a bit about the Capstone Capstone projects. It's super, super exciting to see how students are working, uh, you know, after learning um, all of these, you know, the coursework that, that, that I mentioned at the beginning, 
uh, the capstone project is about going to a client and do a real world project that the client actually cares about. And, and this means that, you know, getting legal office to sign off on getting the data, you have some messy data trying to clean it up and um, getting to a, to, a, to a point where you can actually create something valuable to the client. So here are some, some examples um, uh, from the past. So these are typically like machine learning uh, applications or, you know, improving the data pipeline of the client. Um, and these capstone projects run from like January to depending, so starting in January, the process, and then finishing in, in June. Uh, so we think that's a good opportunity, not only for students, but also for the companies that are, that are, um, that are doing these, um, that are doing these projects. Now, why am I saying all this? We would like to call on, on you to, you know, connect with us and, and be part of that experience. So, you know, as I mentioned, if you're interested in a degree, come and apply, but I understand that that might not be uh, um, the strongest use case for you. But there are a number of other ways in which we are looking for, for uh, links with the Vienna data science uh, community at large. One is we have a use case seminar, and actually uh, this winter is going to be run by Wolfgang. So we're very much looking uh, forward to this, where basically companies and people are presenting their use cases in machine learning and, and other data science projects. And it's super useful for the students to see real world uh, use cases. And we are always actively looking for uh, people who who are willing to talk about their interesting, interesting projects. And the capstone, as I already mentioned, uh, I think it's a great deal for companies as well because you basically get uh, you know, high quality, well-trained uh, students who are willing to put a lot of drive into, uh, into your project. And we're always looking for uh, new capstone projects uh, similar to what we've had before. But if you have an idea, hey, I've always had, I think the best capstone projects are at this stage might be more at the proof of concept right? or not even that maybe I, I've always had this idea that I wanted to try, but I don't really have the resources. I, I didn't get approval from my manager yet. And, and maybe that would be an interesting thing to explore. So that's something that, that we would be super happy to help you with because we could assign like one or two students and then you can go and see, see if as a proof of concept project that works. Um, and in, in three or four months, you can, you can get something done uh, out of it. So, um, Another uh, event to, to mention here, in January, January we're going to have a business analytics or data analytics uh, jamboree here at CU. Uh, so make sure to mark your calendar. It's going to be a, 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 great, a great event. Our keynote is going to be Eduardo de la Rubia, who is a data science uh, lead at Meta. Um, so make sure to, to, to mark your calendars. It's going to be a lot of... Uh, Lot of activities. We're going to look at the the thing from various angles, data science, but also from economics. Uh, so we hope to see you uh, see you there there as well. So I'll, let me just um, stop here. Put a QR code where we, you can find our contacts, and uh, super happy to to uh, talk more and enjoy enjoy the rest of the meetup. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think we'll just will proceed directly with uh, Wolfgang. As I mentioned, he is our chair of the Vienna Data Science Group. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Miklos. Yeah, I, I will do the the use case seminar, and and I hope to to bring something interesting back. Let's let's see if people show up. So. Um, when at a when at data science group, uh, I often have here the excuse now, and I ask how many people are are here the first time. You are my excuse for 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 actually do it doing these slides again because some people here are here in the first row already here that I think the fiftieth time. So I follow you here, but for for all others, uh, who is the 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 Vienna data science group? So we are not just a meetup. We are a real full-blown non-profit association promoting knowledge. So really uh, educating people 
And yes, we cared about societal impact of data science long before that was a term in the AI Act because we are here since 2014, before data science was really cool. And I think we will be here after data science will be cool again, or not cool, um, I don't know. Sometimes in the future, because everything will, will then be auto, uh, automated. And yes, our main mission besides this, I don't know, pillar one, pillar two, pillar three is mostly you, because this, this is our foundations. We are for data scientists, by data scientists. We don't sell anything. We, we don't give you goodies afterwards and say, hey, we are so cool, please come and buy whatever. No, we are not selling anything besides maybe one exception, but I will kind of come to that later. Uh, yeah, and uh, maybe right before, because I had this talk again today and I had it for hundreds of times over, over the, the last years, when we talk about data science, we mean everything. ML engineering, data engineering, AI engineering, and everything else which came up during the last years, because when we started, it was everything, and we still mean it like that. We, we are very inclusive, so, uh, so we have talks about databases and also talks about, I don't know, the right philosophy of doing project management uh, in data science, AI, and so on and so forth. So that's our target group everyone doing something with data. You can call it data professionals, how, however you want. Um, these, these are our board members. Normally I just show them to, if you have further questions, these are the guys and girls to, to go to. Three of them will be here, Florian, me, and Jody will, will come back later. Um, and what are we doing for you? Mostly um, what you see is events. So this, this one is our traditional knowledge feed. It's a very traditional event. We have two talks. Afterwards, there will be pizza, beer, and we will have, have some talks. That's nice. We are, but we are also doing, for example, hackathons. This is not um, depicted here and where we are quite proud of data science cafes. Um, that we are doing not that often because it's quite a lot of work. It's our much more interactive format where we have normally four to six mentors with a small group caring about a very specific um, topic, discussing it, sometimes really coding. So we started um, here uh, as a bit of an interactive hackathon. So bring something and do something with it to, for, for, for a specific topic. Um, I would say it works quite well, but it's a lot of work for us. And my, my question on uh, in this occasion is that often who participated in a data science cafe? Ah, very, very. So we nearly don't have an, an overlap here between the, these two uh, meeting formats, which is good for us because then it's worth it, it seems. Um, so thanks, thanks for that. That's was three people or something like that. Yes, and uh, I talked about selling you something. Well, we are selling the knowledge because I, I talked before um, about data science and how we see it. And then we had this idea years ago then to, to bring that together about how do we see this whole thing. And we were a bit megalomanic, like in the sense of we wanted to cover everything. Yeah, okay. It's now our third edition, depending the second in, in, uh, in English. And I would say if you really hold it up now at the moment, it can't get bigger. We, we have to, to have two, two copies, so two books for the next edition, no, no other way. But I can really promise you, it's really exhaustive. It's a handbook. If you really read every, every one of the 900 pages, give us a review, you will be I don't know how many authors have really read the whole book. It, it, there are 22 authors now. So very welcome if you want to contribute there. Yes, we are quite proud of it. And yeah, for sure, there will be a raffle about that. And the I would say the goal here is to have the same reaction as last time uh, when there was a big outcry of, yes, I did it. We are very proud of that. 
that the winner was really happy and excited about it. So maybe for the next one, let's see. He actually, uh, um, he actually shared the story that he wanted to buy the book the day before the event. Ooh. And he didn't do it. <laughs> so that's why. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But okay. But it was not nice. only. That's not it the was only nice. reason. Um, as you already noticed, um, yeah, we are happy to to collaborate with well, with CU, but not only, also Accelerate, Init, uh, and so on and so forth. We are happy to collaborate with for all the all the meetings I just uh, described to you. Yeah, maybe we, I'll okay. jump in just one second because I think yeah, it's uh, fairly new to go back. So we have this collaboration with Innis and URCC, and there will be a series of events next year, which um, that are very nice locations. So we are at um, yeah. um, very nice Vienna, Vienna Scientific Cluster, for instance. There will be a guided tour there. We will have uh, two meetups at uh, Two of the Sky. Um, so we we'll, uh, we yeah. kind of are wrapping up a little bit. Uh, huh. Um, to match this location as well. Um, but stay tuned. We will send out um, the meetups, of course, when we're ready to do yeah. so. We're really looking looking forward to that. I, I want to see the scientific cluster as well. So. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, all, it's always just boxes, but nice photos. Uh, no. Um, we like our sponsors because... <laughs> Often, yeah, it's good to uh, to have a bit of possibility to just have a bit of catering or something like that. Today, sponsored by CU again. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. And um, we uh, we also want to promote sometimes some some companies. Before uh, last meetup, we had Neo4j here, cool people, and there will be the Dev Conference by by Neo4j on seventh of November. 40, 24 hours free uh, online conference. What the hell? Okay. So bring a lot of, not beer maybe, a lot of whatever you want, club mate. But I'm pretty sure it's worth it. And for sure, yeah, nothing without people who are really organizing it, like Laura and me and others. So we are quite open for people uh, supporting us. So if you want to see more of that, please contribute, join. Uh, believe me, um, all, uh, if you have maybe one hour a week, completely enough. So just, just come forward. Normally we don't bite. <laughs> Normally. Uh, yes, we still have email. Sorry about that. Um, LinkedIn works quite good for us. And yes, we are still uh, doing a lot on, on on Slack. You can join there any uh, any time. Maybe one question there: hmm? like How many people are already registered at Slack? And like, hmm. still working. Not, not too many. I know there's not too much content there yet, so it's. I think at some point we'll get there. And for sure on Meetup, but yeah, you may know that, <laughs> and should be part of it. And that's it uh, from me. Hmm, that's. 10 minutes. That's okay. And now I'm, I'm not standing there between you and the real cool stuff um, again. So please come on stage. Yeah. Yeah, so it's um, really excited that we have those two speakers today. Um, I think it's yours. So um, this talk, so we have uh, Roland Bobilov here with us. Um, for those of you who don't know him, so he's one of the co-founders of Mostly AI. So you might have heard of, of this company. Um, since then, he's doing uh, other projects as well. So uh, it's an angel investor, uh, it's an advisor, and uh, oh, there's also a recent co-founding um, project which has started. Um, if you want, you can share it. Uh, maybe um, if there's not enough time, you can also then just approach him afterwards. Um, but yeah, um, enjoy the talk and yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to give a talk here about the power of many leveraging multi LM strategies for better AI products. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, how does it work? Yes, it does work. Yeah, about me. Thanks. You you have been um, giving already a very nice intro. So after my after my um, um, education at university, I, I joined uh, DRAI. Uh, in the data science team 
as data engineer, data scientist. And there, and the idea of anonymization using synthetic data came up. So with my colleague, Claudio, and the third co-founder, we founded uh, Mostly I uh, in 2017. Um, after after leaving, um, I've been working as, as, as angel investor and advisor. And, and recently, uh, together also with Claudio, uh, we founded uh, Hinetra, uh, a, new, a new company working on AI projects. So uh, as I've seen, it's really... Um, fashionable to, to gather data with a, with a quick survey. So let me, let me try this as well. Uh, who has been playing around with the LM already? Wow. Almost basically everyone. Yeah. Who, who has, uh, who has um, built something, some, some product or some, some solution, which includes some LLM, which is in production. So yeah, 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 yeah. Already. Yeah. Yeah. But not so many anymore. Yeah? This is maybe 10% of the people who, played around with it, um, built something. So, and I think that's, that's really interesting because it's, it's, it's a big hype. Yeah, of course. Um, but it's, it's all about the, the ingredients, um, about to, to bring it to production, what to, what to put in. Yeah. What, what to put in. So it's the same, like with, with, with cooking. Yeah. So what, what do you do today? Yeah. When you want to cook something, yeah, you start with the ingredients, the recipe. So what would be the natural thing you ask? ChatGPT for a recipe, of course. So um, when you start, sorry, it's in, it's in German, but I think it's okay for everyone, maybe. Um, yeah, 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 no. Okay, so so the question was, um, what to, which vinegar and oil to put in for a, a cable salad, a salad of cables, so, so and and you all know these this issues, um, LMs have, it gives the, the perfect answer, but but it basically it's, it's something is not not that right yeah so um it's about um the talk today is about um agents about ai agents so um simply ask for second opinion yeah and, and the, because they're lambs they know but you need to need to help them to find that so the, the idea is to ask a second model or a second agent um, please check this for correctness yeah and this is just simply it, just ask check this 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 question from the user and the answer is this correct yeah and what you get is uh, basically yes um, uh, a long thing this is uh, GPT 4.0 it gives you a long um, explanation and then it says ah but ah, there is a small hint maybe there is a misunderstanding or a typo the cable salad is not something to eat it maybe is crowd salad something else yeah so 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 you see immediately even in the in the simplest setup uh, in the simplest uh, agentic uh, architecture for two agents, it brings already a benefit. It helps you um, getting better results in, the, in, in that sense. So, but there are so many different um, ways to put your agents together. So, um, let's let's talk a little bit through through what, what approaches uh, are available there. So, one thing is like you have a supervisor. Each agent communicates with a single supervisor agent which makes decision on which agent to call next and what to do with that like here you you get a recipe and then you ask some agent for 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 uh, for the for the for the check for correctness maybe then ask is this the recipe with the right ingredients and so on so you have kind of one orchestrator which which works goes through or maybe you have just one supervising agent um which just does just tool calling, just goes there and calls tools with, with functions um, and then does not really expect um, a new um, response from this intelligent agent, but simply calls tools. Uh, another way to put it would be like, okay, you have each agent can communicate with each other and any agent can decide on which agent to call next in that sense. So it's really then it gets, you can, you can, uh, can, you can build complex um, systems they can then create, uh, you can create specialist agents for each task or domain. And then um, each, each route, uh, each, each task is then routed to the right, to the right expert. For example, if you, if you would uh, have, if you want to parse a PDF and then you have a table, you, you route the table to the expert uh, agent for extracting data from, for example, the, the, the table in that sense. So, and, and of course, um, complex uh, problems need complex uh, solutions in, in, in a way um, and complex architectures. So you can basically build your, 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 crazy, your crazy thing with a lot of different um, things around, yeah, with, with different um, 
um, orchestrators on the top and then independent agents solving solving um, a simple task and complex tasks to, to get the result you desire. So uh, one example here would be like uh, debating jury of agents. So I'd like to give you a concrete example. You, you have um, an air product which, um, which helps you as an assistant, for example, and, and then uh, some user asks something and, and you want to know if this AI product gives concise um, answers. Yeah. So you could give out the task to multiple different agents to a jury. You can do this in, independently, like give a different prompt and then tell, ask, is this, is this, with this question and this answer to this, is this, is this concise? Or you can do it step by step, like put the thing to one agent, get the result, and then give the second agent already the, the thoughts and the answer from the first and so on and do it step by step or in a circle, in a loop, like they, they communicate. And, and by that, um, it can improve. It, you can improve the results. And then in the end, you need to aggregate the results in a way. Yeah, You, you maybe need an agent in a sense as a judge who then creates the, the verdict and the final answer. Yeah, okay, I rate this. Yes, this is concise. No, this is not concise in a sense. So you can put together your uh, agent system in that way. So what kind of um, um, types of agent roles in, in LM queries you could use? Maybe there is this generator and then the critic. Yeah? So, so um, as, as we've seen in our example, we could, we could just generate a first, first draft and then get the review and then improve on the results on that. And so do it iteratively. Or uh, critic with a specific focus, is it concise? Does it um, use right language and so on? And the plausibility checker, of course, um, uh, large language models can check for logic, but not for facts. So if you have a fact checker, maybe this is a something specialized, which goes out to the internet and checks the facts. Is this correct? What is in there? And then um, also a jury of peers, peers to get a consensus, like you, you need to iteratively uh, converge to, to one solution with, together with, with, uh, with one thing, which is a moderator. Also, you could have like, of course, an AI helping you to build the whole agent system, which is then kind of a strategy builder, but this is still still challenging, a challenging task to, to achieve in that way. So the question is, who are the agent? What, what is an agent? Yeah, we, what, what can it be? You, you, it could be like the same, the same model, all the same. Yeah, that would be, of course, um, do, doing the same thing. The same model, it would be the straightforward approach. All agents are the same model. Yeah, that would be the simple thing. Just put on GPT 4.0, put everything you want to have, like the critic, the moderator, everything in the same would be the, the advantage. But of course, is it the best approach? Can you can you get some benefits by doing uh, heterogeneous agents? Yeah, maybe yes, yeah, because the difference, there are differences, yeah. So maybe some some is um um has, has different skills. Yeah, maybe one, one model is faster. One model is maybe open source. You can run it on your machine and you don't pay so much for it or something. Or yeah, there, there are uh, advantages. And maybe also you don't need such a complex model to do simple tasks. Yeah. So, so in that sense, um, here in our example for, for um, the, the question to, to get this right, um, to, 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 cor to check for correctness of our recipe, uh, we can use not GPT-4.0, but maybe just uh, GPT-3.5 Turbo instead. And um, this is the result from 4.0, but and then here it, it gives you the long poser thing. And then also here is the, the, the hint for that. But uh, 3.5 already, yeah, it, it, it seems there is a, there is a, there is a, a question with, with uh, Carpet Start and Carpet Start and it, it doesn't work out. And already this a lot cheaper and a lot faster model can, can do the job for, for your um, correctness check here. Yeah? So there, there, uh, there it can make sense. To, to use agents with different costs and speed and, and capabilities to solve your uh, uh, to solve your task and help you with creating a good uh, multi agent system and of course uh, thinking of, of agents with specific capabilities always makes sense like there are um, AI models which have included internet search or things like that you could you could add or can work with different um, modalities or what what you um, whatever is, uh, what do you think um, yeah and, and the thing is then um, multi-agent frameworks um, as everything in the LLM field is popping up like mushrooms in, in autumn. Like there, there are so many um, uh, uh, libraries um, you can, they, which are focusing on different aspects of it. For example, Langchain agents, um, they, this is out there. Uh, they provide um, 
a good a good a good basic um, functionality to to create your multi agent system autogen uh, comprehensive um, framework from from microsoft for conversational ai uh, and then a swarm a new a very new thing uh, from openai which was released just um, not not 20 days ago um, which which says it's it's it says it's experimental and it's for expo uh, educational um, and exploring um, and not not for production as as they as they um, label it and say it and and then if you want to go maybe a step a step further as mentioned uh, with some strategy builders the auto GPT AI agents that automate complex workflows yeah. That that is also uh, out there, but there will be if you if you're really going to search and uh, have a look at the AI agents, you will find a lot a lot of uh, different um, possibilities. And of course, you can for for the simple things uh, or to to really try it out and understand everything. You could you could implement your your simple architecture for yourself, of course, like to get the results from your favorite model, put then the prompt together and push it to the to the next uh, model and so on. So this is also, I think, uh, a, a very valid and good approach uh, to do things. So to sum up in that sense, I mean, using a multi-agent approach, it gives you better results. Yeah? It, it's, it's in the model. Like um, the, the model knows it that it's wrong, but it needs just a second pass over it. Uh, if, you, if you think about um, when you did some exam or something and then you hand in your essay, uh, in, in, in the university or in school even, and then you get it back and you see, ah, there was this one error. Uh, if I just had time, if I would have, would have had time to read through this error, I would have seen that error. Yeah? And, and this is the same, I think, with this. This, this is a good picture for, for thinking about how, how LMs work. You just need this, this critic, this proofreading in the second, a second run um, to really get more out of it. And, and with this um, architectures, with, with multi-agent architectures, um, you, you can... Uh, definitely um, solve more complex tasks than, than with just a simple one prompt and get the results out of it. That, that's, that's sure. Yeah. And then, of course, the potential cost savings, like really splitting the task to um, complex and simple things and then using really cheaper models, um, especially when you do larger uh, scale things or you want to provide a product which maybe hundreds and thousands of users um, uh, should use. Then of course the cost factor is is, is of, of something you need to consider in that sense. Yeah. yeah so I don't have the time uh, on, but I think. Okay. Still. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. So. so but yeah. Um. That, that's already already the end uh, of of uh, what I wanted to to tell about the multi agent uh, approach, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks. So we have uh, some time to go into more depth. So if you have any questions, um, let's kick it off. So thanks for your talk, uh, very interesting. Um, I would like to know how you make sure that you know the different setups that you've been talking about. If you're tuning your model and your setup of these different LLMs, how to make sure that you're actually you know, reaching more quality than before? So that you converge to some setup that you say um, is uh, mm -hmm. good enough. Yeah, yeah, um, a good good point. Thanks, uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, in that sense, you you like you organize um, and use uh, multiple um, agents in that sense, and then try uh, or, or try or one way would be to really um, let let them debate and, and try to converge to a to a conclusion. Yeah, and. Um, like like in the example with uh, ingredients, yeah, the first thing is already already in in uh, running a one second round of it, yeah, gives you gives you it gives you an indication here is something wrong and so on. And if you then let it let it improve, and then um, you could maybe do a loop and see if 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 a correction uh, agent doesn't have to 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 critique anything anymore, yeah. And then you go to the next agent and let let this go around, yeah. And in that way, I think you can uh, ensure that that you improve. Um, the the result by letting multiple agents um, um, see that the criterion is met in that sense. I would I would um, suggest to do it in that way. Yeah. In your particular example with the kraut salat and the kabel salat, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a nice uh, setup would be one that would say, okay, you have the kraut salat there um, instead of the kabel salat. Mm -hmm. You made a mistake, or otherwise, round would say this is just a fake question. Uh, presumably the answer is totally wrong and the user would just wanted to kid you. So 
uh, you understand my question. Yeah. So, so you know, is, is there again human interaction necessary to 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 make quality assurance of what is uh, the actual setup, or would that converge into some sort of you know, mm -hmm. setup that that's uh, usable there? Yeah, I think I think um, it, it it both both. Yeah, I think uh, one thing is that I think it would be important really to provide um, the user to the possibility to give feedback. Yeah, that you can then have quality assurance in a way that um, this this thumbs up and some thumb button to, to get uh, feedback on, and then they can see what was the wrong thing. Maybe and also the user can comment, "Man, God, uh, you 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 provided me an answer. It's, it doesn't make any sense." Yeah, but hopefully you don't. Uh, you can uh, hopefully you can really reduce the fraction of wrong answers in your system in that sense yeah um but also um, um having, having the feedback but also putting in uh, other quality measures like really testing the the thing you leave uh, you, you you bring to production um really thoroughly with with a lot of um quality assurance um measures that would, that would suggest yeah Uh, hi, Holland. Thank you Hello. for the nice uh, overview, Thanks. which was very theoretic. Uh, and my question is much more practical. So, mm -hmm. so I have a bunch of questions, but the first one is, so have you used uh, a multi-agent framework or designed to implement some practical use case? Mm -hmm. If yes, which use case? If yes, which framework? And then I have further questions. If if we have a yes for, for, for the first one. Yeah, for, yeah, for uh, that, yes, uh, did that with, with LangChain, like the implementation, for, for example, this jury of, of, uh, of charges, yeah, in that sense, did this uh, work pretty well um, to, to use then different models, like not only GPT models, like also a cloud to get the results and then um, tested it with, with responses from a, from a chatbot, yeah, and, and to get, and to see really that the system works and converges to a, to a good, um, result and with this um, uh, insights, we could can go back and improve the prompt, uh, the prompt, the system, the original system where the where the data is com was coming from, uh, where we where we were uh, trying to to score the results from. Yeah, that's it. Well, what was the use case? Uh, it, um, the use case, the use case for the for the agent system was to to uh, quality assure the output from a from a chatbot. Like you, you create you create the chatbot for for uh, let's say IT support, um, and then and then it it um it it is the interactions with users are uh, are recorded, and then you have this data, and with this data you go to your your agent system, and then you want to just uh, go through uh, conversation by conversation and ask if it is this this chatbot did it give the the concise uh, answers for example yeah, and then but the chatbot itself is this a uh... The user-facing chatbot is mm -hmm. it a reg application or, or what's that? Yes, yeah, a reg application which which provides um, IT support answers to internal for internal use cases. Of course, which the, uh, the model itself does not uh, is not able to answer, but needs the reg to really give them the right result. Okay, so this is a nice point. Mm -hmm. You say to give the right result because we feel some. We, we, so everybody does reg, and the question is how mm -hmm. to improve the quality of the reg. And so my experience is that it's really hard to get really good results. And the right result is, so today it's impossible, I think, to get 100% accuracy in the correctness of the results yeah. of a REC system. And the question is, well, everybody tries to improve this a little bit. Mm -hmm. And my question is, I guess, what are your experience with the success or, or you know, or, or the failures in Mm -hmm. I think I think um, in in that way it's really uh, important to assure that the system, if it's if it's not sure if it's the right answer or not, that it did it tell so. Yeah, I think in that in that sense, it, it needs um, you need to build in mechanisms um, that if if the reg is not getting uh, if, if if you query then the your, your your vector database, yeah, and you give you get, you put in the context, but the model is not able to to answer it. Um, based on the context, then you need to also to, to ask uh, and to make um, quality assurance questions like, um, uh, please tell me from where did you get your your answer and so on. And then and then with 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 back and forth, and and you realize okay, it is not it is not um, um, giving the right uh, cannot point to the right um, to to a, to an area in your vector database. Then you would need to just inform the user, okay. I cannot answer it properly, yeah? and not and not do it like here, like just silently 
put out something yeah in that sense to to get a, you asked that because you say you cannot hide to 100 percent I'm I'm, I'm 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 also put um confirm that yeah that it would be really hard to get 100 accuracy but uh when it when it uh, does not uh doesn't find the right um answer it should be uh, a mechanism there that that you inform the user cannot answer it and then please uh, contact uh, the support or second level support to help you with your question in that sense i would suggest to do that so this is what you typically write in the system prompt of the reg generator agent let's say right if you cannot answer, say that you yes, fine. correct, correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, in the in the yes, correct. Like um, there there should be then some some. It it should be like really a multi agent system. It gives you the it correct. It gives you the result, and then it should be checked, and then it should reason about is it is it the right answer and so on. And then and then for the for the agent which gives the final uh, answer with all these uh, debates and and uh, about that, there it should have this mechanism, yeah, in the prompt. Where it says, "Okay, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not able to answer it. Please contact um, then the human." That sense. And there's a, another thing that I found quite difficult, or also maybe impossible, mm -hmm. is that it's impossible for me. It's impossible to separate the knowledge of the foundation model from the knowledge in the REC system. So mm -hmm. if it find, so it's impossible for me at least. Or mm -hmm. so, so can you speak to this? So. Did, do you have any thoughts on the issue of separating the knowledge yeah, 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 yeah. foundation model from the knowledge in the REC system in in the answer? Yeah, but if you if you um, like like this um, chain of thought um, um, approach, and in that sense, if you really ask for where did you get the answer from, and if it cannot cannot point to the to 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 something from 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 the context. Um, then it would be a strong indication that it's that it's not answered from from the context what you would appreciate and would need, and is rather answered from from the internal knowledge of the model in that sense. Yeah, but yeah, um, uh, I don't have a, a hundred percent recipe which which always would work to to separate that. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> there are other people as well. Maybe you can, uh, if you have time, you can add one more question, or otherwise afterwards. <laughs> Um, I didn't catch two of the things, and I'm gonna repeat it. Um, Pardon, I, didn't understand. I didn't catch some of the stuff, and I'm gonna just ask again. Um, okay. One of the thing is, you said that you have a use case, or you have it put it to the cut for the customer in the business side. You already have a customer there to implement such a thing for them. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. How do you? I just have two questions. Um, infrastructure wise, let's mm -hmm. talk about the business, go to the customer side, how you manage this infrastructure, hardware, cloud, and another thing is cost management. How do you talk about this cost? If you have multi agents with different uh, size of the model and um, how you can deliver such a thing to the customer and do the cost management, a little bit more detail. How you do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for for that, um, for for the for the um, it, it runs in, in the cloud. Yeah, like there there is the the the, the whole um, the whole the whole solution in the in that sense. It it runs um, in the cloud and uses uh, public available um, models. Yeah, and and um, just just uh, what you what you do is it's it's uh, it's then basically a, a platform where you can then do a lot of a lot of um, um, evaluations. Um, on, on the different uh, on on your on your AI product in that sense, yeah. So and and what what we did um, was just provide a part of the of these valuations and, and 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 metrics kind of in that sense, yeah. And so um, this is definitely something which is then uh, could be running in the in the uh, account of the customer, yeah. That it's not um, then and then they they provide their API keys in that sense, yeah. Like you, you can then maybe also would be able to. Uh, in the future, then for 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 this um, for this product, it should also then be able to connect maybe to Azure AI Studio or things like that. That you can just put in your AI product, and then it runs the benchmarks and does everything. And and then the 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 product, of course, runs in the custom environment. But then also um, the the there would be two two models. Either you run it in your uh, on your account in your bill, or or you run it in in the in in the in the in the normal in the in the in the, in the, in the Global in the global setup, and then just bill the customer about what the customer has been using um, in that sense. Uh, 
Okay, uh, my question is more about theoretical perspective. Here you mentioned one uh, multi-agentic workflow about the strategy making. Mm -hmm. So it's so challenging. And at the same time, it also has a much potential. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask that uh, in this uh, strategy maker workflow, so also you can see the topologies that you mentioned at the start, like hierarchical or like this kind, or uh, or it is just the uh, automation between the agents that they decide upon that what uh, like uh, uh, in which order they have to act, or it is also the human interaction and mm -hmm. human incorporate uh, like this kind of strategy. If it's still human incorporation, so then what is the automation or what is what how we can say that it's a strategy maker multi agentic workflow. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah 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 I, um, I understand yeah i think i would the the strategy maker would would in in that way really uh create uh agents uh, automatically like the the the, the strategy maker then, uh would would understand what do i need to to assess and then would create the prompts um, to really create another agent yeah um to, to do that so the the human interaction that way once the system is set up i think would be would be minimal like you you give it a problem and then the the policy maker creates agents um, autonomously, in that sense, without without the, the human interaction, and and also and also um, it, it depends, of course, how, how you how you would configure it. Um, but but um, for for the, for the orchestration, then um, the, the, maybe there should be a schema, or for your task, some 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 schema, um, or, or some type of agents. Like there is the the, the I don't know, first analytics agent, uh, and then there is the I don't know the the result result um, um, creating and then the third level would be maybe aggregation uh, agent type yeah and and this system could maybe then just create these agents autonomously and then just um, also do, does the scheduling maybe it thinks it needs two analysis agents and then creates two and then does these two agents and then goes to the next step and next step and next step so I think um, it, it can it can be automated um, in the, on the long run yeah, without uh, human detection maybe one question from my side so um when you talk about putting something to production like uh how do you see companies react to concerns about privacy and security i mean it is something we can people usually are very constrained to put yeah 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 it, it, this is um some some yeah some some companies they they, they just say okay yeah we, we use it we want to have benefit and, and just uh, and do it uh, and use the public the public hosted models and then there are of course companies which which um which which do not um, um, would never never do that because maybe their their highest uh, business value is in their source code for example and they would never allow that their trade secrets are sent to 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 some open API um, to get back some code completions or something like that yeah and they they um, tr would would really like um, to have some solution to have it run on premise with an open source model yeah that that's 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 also uh, these these customers are also there. Yeah, in that sense. That's, uh, how do you like say how many customers are like? Pardon? How many? How many customers are indifferent to security and how many are like? Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, this, uh, I have my, my sample size is not big enough to really give a, a proper estimation of the of the of the proportion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to be a little challenging here. Uh, actually, the first question, the second question, I. You answered it as though it's possible to guarantee you're going to be monotonically increasing the quality. And my experience is it's very, very easy for almost all these models to find use, find examples where no matter how you prompt, you're getting, sorry, you're getting bad answers, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't get better. Um, my question, though, is from a business perspective, mm -hmm. not a single one of these model makers is making money. They're all spending money by the billions, hoping that there's a business there. Your architecture, whether you build it for somebody or they built it themselves, implies that they're going to have lots and lots of different agents from different vendors necessarily. They're not going to be around. Most of these vendors are going to get bought out. They're going to, they're going to fold because there's no money that anybody's making. So how can you justify a multi-agent architecture for a business use case when the companies that are providing this right now are providing the 
they're providing they're providing a service without making money so they won't be here so yeah. that's my question that's that's a good point um um this i think this refers also to the to the the fast pace uh, all these uh, developments are are taken in the large language uh, model space um i think um the, the the maturity of of the whole the whole market i think is, is pretty early stage i would i would if i, if I can use this uh startup term in a way yeah it's experimentation phase um prototypes are there the customers are using it um and and just to give an example like even even if you have your system set up you have all your prompts you have your your product done yeah and then uh one one uh, vendor like OpenAI releases the new version of the model and then you just you switch the version and nothing works anymore in that sense yeah that, that's the that's the normal thing in that sense yeah so uh, i don't know how, how how it will be solved in the future but but um that, that's definitely definitely something um um, what what needs to be considered in in that that uh, the the systems will be really flexible and and uh, can adapt fast because as you, as you mentioned um the, the business case is really hard then to 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 um to 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 make in a way yeah that you spend a lot of money to create something and then um it will fail because the vendor is going out of business or something like that yeah i think yeah, yeah. look i'm looking forward to how this how this will develop Thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, my question was more specific to when you get the results. Mm -hmm. So as a business owner, you kind of want to see how accurate your models are or not. If you're providing a service to a company, they want to see how accurate your results are. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, how, how do you benchmark your models or the performance of a chatbot, for example? And do you, is there a tool or do you make it in-house or how do you benchmark it and show them how good the model? Well, how good? The mm -hmm. And I think I think it's here. It's it's not it's not um, uh, it's not a, a quantitative output. I think and and yeah, you need to have some some measure, a quantitative measure in the end. And and I think uh, what what um, the measure really is 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 did did this for for the chatbot especially did it solve your your request properly? Yeah, did it did it really help um, to to answer the question? And there you can can measure it in, in terms of. Um, uh, in terms of ratio um, um, requests or conversations um, executed, um, and then um, um, how, and how often has the has the support then uh, be, be be contacted or the button has been pressed um, on? Um, I need I need help. It didn't solve in that sense. Yeah, that that would be a quantitative measure to to, to really uh, ensure that. So this is more in the production when it's already for the users, but if, before you give it out for the users because mm -hmm. I think most of us are also still developing it and yeah. are still unsure about mm -hmm. if it's good or not. How do we test it in the pre previous stages? In the previous stages, um, I think what, what, uh, what, what for, for one customer, what we, we have planned uh, is, is really a test phase. Yeah. Where, where the, the internal, you have some, some, of course they're the, 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 IT, the IT stuff is maybe not the best, the best um, to test. You need really some, some test users, um, who would then really also be part of the group who really uses the product in the end of the day um to give you to give you feedback on on on, on the results yeah and then also maybe improve like like the multi agent approach yeah you get uh, create something get feedback and then improve on that i think that is the only way to do because it's so so um stochastic kind of what you get um, when creating such a product okay i guess if there are no other Maybe we'll take one more question. Thank you very much. Uh, you talk about the heterogeneity of the agents. Mm -hmm. I would like to bring up the heterogeneity of users. And my question will be formulated about the efficiency of the algorithm with the number of prompts, because in many cases, you know that the quality of the answer is deteriorated. Uh, it's losing and related to that is not accurate. Uh, my question it is in the pretest, when you have the possibility to see the user using the algorithm, some of them are not are stopping after one question, one prompt. And uh, maybe something very critical in the decision and indirectly with impact in the company, in the society. Uh, from my perspective, it's an ethical issue. 
should you inform the user, maybe you should ask more, or should you inform the user when it comes to the critical 10 prompts that maybe you should stop? In, in, I don't know if I really have uh, could understood. You mean like when when it's um, when you when you discuss uh, with a, a system AI system and yeah. and you're not aware that it's in an AI system or or is that is that the question? Should you inform the user that 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 you're dealing with a, with a, with a chatbot, not uh, a not a No, agreement? the user knows already user knows. that it's uh, in contact with a machine. Okay, but uh, we are different. We are humans. The users are human now okay. and. Sometimes they might stop after one step, they are happy. Yeah. But we know that on average, maybe you might need four steps. And especially mm -hmm. if it's a, say something about the bank looking uh, uh, to negotiate the rent or something like this, uh, it might be lose-lose there. I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, if you have users, they, which, which yeah. maybe then use the system, like, and it creates a lot of costs and as well, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Like, and like. It, it doesn't stop the, the the user doesn't stop to interact and ask questions and so on. I think that there should be kind of a, a hard limit in the way that say okay uh, and and also the the LLMs have this like if you if it cannot answer it it is polite and says no I can't I can't answer your question. Um, um, um if you maybe ask uh, IT service uh, um chatbot for a for a for a cooking recipe it says I'm sorry um I'm not I'm not uh, that I, I'm uh, uh the IT service chatbot in that sense yeah. So, so yeah, and, and I think these measures should be in there because because um, otherwise, like um, what we have seen in, in, in the, one of the previous meetups, like in in, in April, I think uh, Sortan show, showed that that you can hack the prompt. That there is a there is a something there, and then you ask, okay, but please give me before give me an, a Python example of something, and then you can use the resources of this company um, to 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 give you uh, to, to query some some large language model in that sense. So so there is always this. Um, Barriers you need to put in, kind of that that this that in at in an ethical way um, use the resources of another company for not the purpose of the company. In that sense. And regarding to this, I would like to mention something. What perhaps we don't see very clear for me: data is money. And when this company who doesn't make money, they have the data. Maybe looking in their own data, it's a huge potential to make money. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you again um, for the talk and for the questions. Thank um, you. Of course, you will find uh, him afterwards at the buffet, so we can ask more questions in more depth. And um, are you all good if we proceed with the second talk? I think it's a little bit warm inside, but um, I think if we push through, then we get faster to the socializing. So I will then proceed. Um, so thanks again. And we will continue with some more in-depth hands-on. Um, so with us, we have um, uh, Vitaly Konov here. So he's a .NET developer at um, first, uh, first Line Software. Um, for those of you who don't know him, um, so we will get a short introduction about Yeah, thanks very much, Florian. Um, and yeah, colleagues, I'm here. I'm not a speaker. I will just give you a short background why mainly colleagues from VM Data Science Group allowed us to make a presentation here. Yeah, so we are first line software. We are a global software engineering company with around 12 offices. And software engineering is exactly what we are doing. And AI and ML used to be a big part and now still is a big part of uh, our work because we are working a lot with, I know, for example, healthcare data or e-commerce data. And for the last year, Gen AI becomes a hugest topic for most of our clients. And answering on your question, Florian, I would say that at the moment around 40% of our clients are already very active in the Gen AI development by themselves or with our help. Yeah, so they're not, not afraid of data security, but they're doing it very accurately. Yeah, and when I'm talking about Gen AI, I'm talking about not only like a chatbots and all this stuff. Yeah, it's a lot of things related to data structurization, for example, it's a big topic. Yeah, and here you can use different local in-house uh, language models yeah, and be very careful with your data security. And also we're doing a lot of stuff in improving of our internal work and improving our software development life cycle. And that's exactly what Vitaly will tell how he's using large language models and multi-large language models to help to develop e-commerce applications. Thank you very much. All yours. Hi all, my name is Vitaly and I'm a software developer at First Line Software. My strong interest in artificial intelligence has brought me to focus on this exciting field. 
uh, today I'd like to share with you how we can leverage custom AI models for software development. Uh, building on this interest, I decided to conduct an experiment, develop an e-commerce application with assistance of custom AI models. Uh, and in the world of programming, we have uh, uh, low and high level languages, which differ in their level of abstraction. Uh, Low-level languages provide direct access to hardware, while high-level languages make it easier for developers by hiding the complex details of working with hardware. That made me think, what if we could introduce an even higher level of abstraction in the near future? Could AI models become that new level, simplifying software development even further? Uh, for this experiment, my goal was to set up a LLM architecture for software development to see how helpful it can be at this point in time. Uh, so the principle of the context adaptation is that uh, then the model starts, it loads initial data to immediately understand the development context. So uh, this data includes uh, my key technologies, list of uh, frameworks and libraries, uh, information on how to handle specific uh, development cases. Uh, the models are integrated into the process by context adaptation and uh, project uh, and project uh, sorry uh, project code base and documentation analysis from the remote repository. So uh, I have uh, two custom models in my multi LM architecture: uh, a model for feature development and a separate model for code review process. So uh, the first model. Uh, can uh, analyze remote repository uh, and uh, wait for business requirements to implement it with clean code base and update remote repository automatically. Second model is for code review process. It also can scan remote repository, analyze pull requests, and uh, leave corrections or improvements if needed. But during development, I encountered several problems. Uh, first, Guaranteeing a stable data transfer between the models and uh, remote repository was challenging. I found that it's not always easy for the model to handle uh, tasks like working with GitHub structure, uh, processing coded data, uh, handling limits, timeouts, and retrying after failure. Uh, so it's required a careful setup to access GitHub. Mm. Uh, um, also, uh, the model needs as much information uh, as it possible. Uh, so I configured the models uh, to document each change and uh, save it to remote repository automatically. This way, uh, the models uh, have enough context uh, for effective work. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, during development, uh, we have uh, special cases, and uh, to achieve uh, better, uh, better uh, performance in development, uh, we have to separate uh, tasks between uh, different models. So as I said before, I have uh, separate models for different uh, development cases. Uh, the main point is that uh, with the proper adaptation, the model can... Uh, provide more effective uh, assistance. It can correct itself if needed. For example, the model can uh, re uh, can generate a code, recognize a better approach, and then adjust its output. This shows that uh, with the right setup, AI uh, model can provide more effective assistance for development. Now let's talk about real use cases. Uh, during development, I implemented uh, features by providing uh, prompts. Uh, and uh, it understands uh, dialect context. So uh, you can, uh, after it implements the logic, you can add corrections or improvements easily. Uh, so uh, for example, when I was working on my e-commerce application, I created a page. Then I told the model to add a new button, and it did so easily without needing more detailed instruction on, or something else. And uh, of course, uh, the models should uh, use uh, the same uh, protocols as other users in production environment for security reasons. Mm. However, uh, 
the AI model provides you summary of all changes it makes every time. So it's quite intuitive when you can see all changes with explanations. Uh, another case uh, includes project analysis. Uh, it can scan remote repository to analyze the project and uh, help with refactoring, provide comprehensive, uh, uh, provide uh, project overview with full structure and architecture description. It is particularly useful for maintaining code quality, uh, onboarding new team members, and uh, research purposes. Also, the AI can uh, review pull requests by assessing code changes uh, against uh, business requirements and uh, project documentation. It will leave uh, corrections or improvements in a separate commit on a remote repository if it's needed. Uh, Gen AI is a powerful tool for everyone, but it cannot replace you because uh, it needs an expert uh, to, uh, to manage it. Uh, in some cases, a uh, technical expert is required for model work, uh, have to provide more technical instructions, not only business requirements. Sometimes they have to fix errors manually. Uh, so humans are still needed. As a result, my approach allowed me to create a multi-LM architecture and I can see uh, the following advantages compared with uh, ready-made uh, ready solutions like chatbots. It's connected to uh, GitHub repository, so uh, the models have uh, access to up-to-date up uh, code base and project documentation from remote repository. Special workflows was designed for each model, uh, so uh, the models uh, know what data to expect and uh, what output to generate. Uh, and uh, also, thanks to context adaptation, uh, the models are more effective and reliable for uh, development cases. Uh, however, my solution is not as innovative as software development agents like Replit, which offer even deeper integration into the process. Uh, recently, new AI models have introduced uh, interesting innovations. Uh, one of them, uh, chain of thought capability, uh, which allows models to reason through problems step by step. Uh, this uh, should uh, improve their abilities in mathematics and programming tasks. Uh, however, it is not possible to create a custom GPT model uh, powered by those features for now. So I hope it will change in the future and I will be able to repeat my experiment and observe the differences. Uh, so this brings me to the end of the story of my experiment. Uh, I uh, set it up a multi-LM architecture uh, during it. And uh, to improve uh, uh, context adaptation and uh, handle specific uh, age cases, uh, I tested it and upgraded it uh, while working on my simple e-commerce e application. You can uh, take a look. Uh, by scanning uh, our code. Uh, thanks all for your attention. Thanks a lot. So you have the opportunity to get more in-depth questions when it comes to actually applying LLMs um, or use case. Um, my name is Konstantin. Uh, I would like to ask you about um, a rack system. It's like a simple rack system. You retrieve the documents or you pre-process contacts before like doing some step. Um, the model uh, before uh, before user uh, before using the model, uh, it uh, loads. Uh, uh, documentation from the remote repository and analyze a code base to understand uh, what uh, what is the project, what uh, is the requirements and uh, what was implemented, what uh, tech stack was used for development and uh, all these things uh, improve, improve uh, model uh, 
model performance, uh, model uh, understand context deeper, and uh, it is uh, more effective for development. So it's limitation with context window, how much documents you can upload. Yeah, 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 yeah. context window, and of course, uh, by uh, providing prompts uh, from the user. Uh, another question, have you checked the uh, already existing projects like OpenDivin and another project that already exists uh, following the simple stuff? Uh, I uh, I had uh, a look uh, on GitHub on some open source projects, and uh, for this experiment, my goal was to do something uh, by my own. And that's it. So hi, I'm Lorenzo. I have a question. You mentioned a lot of um, the importance of fine tuning the model. So what do you mean here by fine tuning? Do you actually fine tune a foundational model, or do you do some other techniques for that? Um, I mostly was uh, talking about uh, context adaptation, and uh, the it is the main. Uh, think what I did in my experiment. And uh, yeah, uh, context adaptation is uh, that uh, before a uh, model can uh, provide you some assistance, it uh, scan all uh, provided information before you start dialogue with it to provide more uh, understanding of context. That's uh, my point. Um, another question. So, did you have? Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, when I said that you this can read uh, GitHub, so you said uh, that it's an agent who has uh, access to to the API of GitHub, right? And you provide the access. Key. Yeah, yeah, right. It uh, connected by APIs for uh, my uh, GitHub repository. Yeah. This is something that um, some product that you're using, which can do this automatically, or uh, did you implement something here yourself? Uh, I provided all necessary uh, endpoints, uh, uh, keys for my uh, private <laughs> repository. So it have access only for uh, uh, for a repository what I uh, give access. So uh, yeah, uh, it is connected by uh, provided scheme with all necessary actions like uh, uh, getting directories, files, uh, updating, reading, uh, getting pull requests, open pull requests, uh, all those actions was uh, provided as a endpoint. So that's a feature of the model you're saying? So, uh, so, so like which model were you using? Uh, I'm, I'm not so familiar with what are the features of all the models which are out there provide. So didn't know that there was uh, <clears throat> some model which you can just feed in with your GitHub keys and then it would be able to retrieve all the information. So maybe we can share a little bit about what model you were using and uh, what maybe other features it would provide. Um, uh, so um, for the simplest uh, way uh, is uh, using, um, uh, it is very simple uh, with uh, GPT models offer uh, uh, special instruments uh, where you can get uh, some information more in human language and it will uh, translate it to uh, more uh, uh, translated to a schema which more uh, more familiar for the model uh, gpt model have this functionality and uh, for for creating a custom model so this is the simplest uh, way to connect uh, the model with uh, some uh, uh, other services. Is It can be not only GitHub, it uh, also can be any other uh, service uh, with, uh, with uh, API endpoints. And from a business case perspective, like uh, do you have an estimate how much um, it cost you to implement your use case? Uh, as about uh, performance, uh, I think I can't say a lot of information because uh, my uh, sphere more about development. I can't. Uh, 
I'm not a manager to calculate costs and so on. <laughs> but there was no manager coming to a desk and slamming on it and like telling users to stop the experiment. So it's kind of, you know, was not exhaustive. Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe you know? No, we have not found it yet. Okay. <laughs> it would be interesting how much uh, you can actually improve the performance versus the, the cost perspective. I found it super interesting and useful um, if you want to develop something in a really fast speed. Uh, the question is, what if uh, the file reached the token limits and how would you would you parse them and then read together? You mean uh, for one node kind of load like endless files for like a really big project and how would you deal with that issue? Um, um, could you repeat, please? Uh, which is the issue? Um, so you want the model to read some files, but then what, what if there are so many files it can't read at once, um, or it just forget the previous memories? And for like a bigger, much bigger project, how I was thinking maybe use different different models to read. Like one model use to read one class, but how would you combine the knowledge together in the end? Um, so, uh, for, for the, this point, I can say that, uh, uh, uh th that, uh, all needed information for the model, uh, is, the uh, described in, uh, special files with all important information. So, uh, before you start the dialogue with the model, uh, it, uh, scan only important uh, information and then uh, while you are talking with the model it uh, loads uh, additional uh, information from the remote repository to provide more uh, effective uh, assistance on your specific case uh, which you are talking with the model yeah maybe i can give a short question uh because as experiment uh, it's a cool thing yeah you used to uh what uh, open AI, AI chat GPT model, which is public, yeah, you used it for this experiment. But for a real clients we have, yeah, I doubt that they will allow us to, let's say, use their code and uh, work with this code on the level of uh, open model. Is there a way you can experiment with some, I don't know, local installed model, smaller one, or do you really need such a big one like uh, chat GPT? Can we take some small model install it in-house and make this experiment again? Uh, yes. Uh, my idea uh, about next experiment is that uh, it is uh, about a security topic. Uh, and uh, uh, I want to uh, use open source uh, model, uh, which uh, can deploy it only on developer machine. And it... Uh, fully, totally isolated on local machine. Uh, and uh, this model will be for security purposes. So uh, it will uh, check all your requests uh, and uh, will delete all, all uh, important information with what, uh, uh, what, uh, what shouldn't be uh, uh, used as uh, as a by security reasons, yeah. So it is totally isolated on your computer and uh, all data on your computer, and uh, it will delete all all important data to for security reasons. But it's my idea about next experiment with small small model. If there are no other questions, uh, if you can proceed to the next agenda point, um, which will be very short, because I think there are no submissions to the open mic. Um, if anybody wants to promote anything, let's take a one minute slot. And if not, then we will proceed to the next, next um, agenda point.
I please give it away for the speaker. Sorry for missing it. Uh, but I think we don't. Just the list there. Yeah. So it's the raffle. So I hope you are all excited to get the book. It's fine. It's totally safe. <laughs> Browser, yeah? Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Okay, we're going to use Google here. Um, <laughs> and I have to check how many we have. Uh, yeah, I know, but that's even more cringe. <laughs> So that's, um, I think it's actually two and what, 65. <laughs> okay, so let's see. So uh, usually we have a lot of uh, no-shows, but uh, let's see who is 61. Oh, sorry, I was there already. Uh, Jacobo, Binati. Perfect, first hit. First hit. We have to hand it over. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm going to take a picture as usual. Sorry to shoot you. Thank you very much. Not here. Thank you. Okay, maybe just one concluding question, so because I know there's a lot of uh, things happening uh, this week and last week. So um, just for us, out of curiosity, like how many of you attended uh, the TED AI uh, last week or last weekend? Okay, not, not too many. Um, the data analytics, analytics conference is actually today and tomorrow. Um, and there's uh, tomorrow, there's another data science event. Anybody plan to go there? Um, I think tomorrow is the one with Ernst Young, right? So I think like, I don't know, it's um, getting crowded, but <laughs> it's uh, really awesome that you found the time to, to come here tonight. And uh, with that, I think we'll close um, the formal part and you will find the uh, food and drinks in the back of the stage. So thanks again. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> 